Good morning. We are right at eight o'clock and I see that we've got great attendance. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our program now. My name is Hunter Hill. I'm a member of the BGR Board of Directors and Chairman of the Breakfast Briefings Committee. I'm excited to welcome you to BGR's third virtual breakfast briefing of 2020. BGR is a private, nonprofit, independent research organization dedicated to informed public policy making and the effective use of public resources for the improvement of government in the New Orleans metropolitan area. BGR's research, reports, and government monitoring are hallmarks of its public policy work in Jefferson, Orleans, and St. Tammany parishes. Breakfast briefings <clears throat> further BGR's mission by allowing citizens and policymakers to discuss issues that affect all of our lives. We encourage you to share this event on social media with others who may be interested. If you do so, please mention at BGR NOLA and use the hashtag BGR briefing. As many of you know, each breakfast briefing includes the opportunity for attendees to submit questions for us to pose to our speaker. Today, we will receive your questions through the Q&A icon at the bottom center of your screen. When you click that icon, a box will appear and you may submit a question by typing it in the Q&A box and hitting return. We hope to see you again at future BGR breakfast briefings, whether in person or virtual. We thank you for responding so enthusiastically to this event and for staying engaged in public policy discussions important to our community. And now to introduce our topic this morning and then moderate the Q&A portion is Amy Glavinsky, BGR's president and CEO. Thank you, Hunter. I'd like to first express gratitude to Iberia Bank, First Horizon, for so generously sponsoring BGR's breakfast briefing series again this year. Your support allows us to create these events and make them free to the public. We welcome everyone who has joined us today and encourage you to visit our website, bgr.org, where we house our report library. It consists of more than 200 public policy reports that BGR has produced over the past 25 years. And now for an introduction to today's topic. Mayor Latoya Cantrell last spoke at a BGR breakfast briefing in September of 2018. Then she had just completed her first four months in office. Her tenure already included major policy initiatives such as reducing gun violence and revamping operations at the city's juvenile detention center. She had begun tackling infrastructure challenges by hiring a new director for the sewage and water board and accelerating the pace of street construction. And she began balancing her first city budget. How the policy landscape has changed since then. The past 10 months alone have presented Mayor Cantrell with unprecedented problems. A cyber attack last December disrupted city operations and continues to have lingering effects with some systems and databases. And as we are all aware, the mayor and her team have worked for the past eight months to control the spread of COVID-19 and its impacts on residents, healthcare resources, and our local economy. On Monday, the mayor proposed a reduced 2021 operating budget. It projects general fund revenue 13% lower than the 2020 pre-pandemic budget. The city has proposed significant budget cuts to offset the revenue decline. This new fiscal reality is quickly reshaping the city's ability to address policy priorities. Of course, these issues are just part of the picture. Here today to provide a more comprehensive view of the budget, infrastructure, and policy priorities for New Orleans at this important time in its history is Mayor La Latoya Cantrell. As we hear from Mayor Cantrell, we will, we will listen to her, her remarks and then have time for questions from the audience. Mayor Cantrell, thank you tremendously for joining us today, particularly on this complicated morning. The BGR breakfast briefing floor is yours. Okay, good morning. All clear? I'm good. All clear, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Well, good morning again, BGR. Um, good partners uh, with the city of New Orleans and what I can say definitely to uh, my administration. I appreciate the support. 
uh, and just want to also acknowledge uh, and express appreciation for uh, BGR for honoring us with a merit award uh, for this year. We appreciate that and it really meant a lot uh, to my team. So I thank you for that. Um, in our case, you know, as a team, uh, the city of New Orleans employees for their outstanding performance in that fair share agreement. Amy, when I mentioned, well, when you mentioned uh, my last time being with you all was September of 2018. And even at that time and on, on that um, uh, platform, I discussed uh, the need for a fair share and us going to Baton Rouge and just doing something a little a bit differently. And although uh, met with some skepticism on the front end, collectively with a strong partnership, we did pull it off for our city. And I just wanna say thank you again for that. Uh, our team you know, also as mentioned is having a very, a very busy week, uh, including preparing for uh, Hurricane Zeta uh, that this morning is coming in a little bit uh, faster even than we anticipated when we went home last night and checked uh, throughout the night. And so um, we're, we're, we're prepared and also just buckling down a little bit more uh, as we have to move and open shelters and the like this morning, getting our folks where they need to be uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Monday, uh, as you know, the, CAI and I, the CAO and I presented our 2021 20, uh, operating budget for uh, the city of New Orleans. Um, what uh, the city is seeking uh, is a unified uh, really approach uh, to this budget. You know, we, this is our, our third, we have been able to form a, a very strong partnership, I would say, as it relates to uh, the budgets that we have presented to the New Orleans City Council and just anticipate that same uh, spirit of cooperation and, and coordination, uh, quite frankly. Uh, recognizing the consequential nature of this budget and, and definitely the need uh, for transparency. What I've told my folks is that, you know, in a fiscal crisis, uh, the demands uh, from the public actually don't decrease, they actually increase. And we have to, we have to do more with less. We can do more with less. And um, we just, we need to get it done. And so in that spirit, folks have just shown up and uh, done what's necessary. Uh, this briefing is an opportunity, as you know, for me to talk about the budget uh, priorities, which I will have to say uh, have not diverted from uh, the focus on infrastructure heavily, being able to maintain our infrastructure, even as relates to uh, affordable housing, of course, as relates to our economy, growth sectors, economic development, workforce uh, development, especially pivoting our people to areas uh, at this particular time, this is a wonderful uh, opportunity and even an obligation uh, to do a much more thorough job of um, with workforce development and training, dislocated worker dollars, uh, and making sure that we are meeting people on the ground, really where they are for employment opportunities. There is work uh, in the city of New Orleans, and our approach has shifted a bit, really going to people and also uh, integrating, I would say, neighborhood navigators that are in communities paid for by Rockefeller partnership we created, uh, you know, equipped uh, our folks with training necessary to, to get out there in the community, of course, with the technology necessary, Wi-Fi, all of those components, but again, just a different uh, strategy and an approach. The Office of Business and External Affairs is uh, another aspect of growth uh, during this period of time because workforce and streamlining processes for businesses uh, to continue to come online and operate in our city just remain a top uh, priority. Let me be clear, uh, in no way are we slowing down. Uh, we're definitely uh, moving forward. We're going to do uh, make sure we're fiscally responsible and that is something that, again, as we've come into this uh, pandemic, it didn't start with the pandemic. Uh, our um, administration, my administration, uh, came into this uh, deficit, quite frankly, um, with a health, a fiscal health that had not been uh, since uh, Hurricane Katrina, whether it's the 
fund balance that that we had coming in here 24 million whether it was the our budget growth of right at two percent uh whether it was that credit rating increase we got just a year and a half you know in office whether it was streamlining our fiscal management system to have all of our uh data systems financial systems talking for the first time a long time challenge uh, for the city, but we had to take it on and so glad that we did. Um, also, um, as it relates to that, uh, it just played very well as we were confronted with this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Again, you know, uh, we came into this pandemic on the other side in terms of public health at a disadvantage, we did. So it was almost um, uh, just, I don't know, I can't even say the best of, of both worlds, but when you want to tackle challenges, you face them head on and you look at them and, and find ways of growth and opportunity. And I believe, you know, we really have done that. So now when we talk about COVID-19, you know, again, that we suffered disproportionately, uh, not just from the virus, but even as it relates to the CARES Act funding uh, that was allocated to the state of Louisiana, as well as diverted and diluted at the state level. And those dollars were intended to be uh, for municipalities and, and like the city of New Orleans and uh, parishes across the state of Louisiana. That has had a significant impact on our 2020 budget, about a 50 million deficit and looking at 100 million uh, as a shortfall as we looked at 2021, you know, like me, you have to forecast, you just don't look uh, just at one year, you have to look at multiple uh, years. And that's exactly what we have been doing uh, at this time. Of course, uh, the work really does speak for itself about our uh, frontline workers, uh, city employees, first responders, uh, all the names, great names that we can call them. We have um, flattened that curve, the surge twice uh, in our city. Uh, you know, the, the huge surge we saw at the, the onset of this, uh, but at the uh, end of the, the day, when we saw uh, levels of, of up creep, I had to uh, immediately go back into um, restriction mode. And again, we did not see a surge like uh, what was anticipated. So again, uh, it speaks for itself. We're the healthiest uh, in the state of Louisiana. We're the healthiest in, in most cities around us, but not only that, in the United States of America, the city of New Orleans is an example. And we're continuing to see steady progress. That is the goal without any regression at all. We're making progress doing that. So now just wanting to make sure that you understand that that progress is coming uh, at the fiscal uh, level as well. As we considered the budget proposal, it was very important to acknowledge the challenges that our city faced during this pandemic. You know, we have um, submitted, we have submitted over 200 million in expenses uh, to uh, the state uh, for reimbursement. Uh, thus far, based on those expenses that have been approved, mind you, uh, the city of New Orleans has received 59 million of those dollars to date. There's an additional 135 million uh, left uh, left on there, meaning of expenses on the table that are approved. Uh, and we are working, really fighting at the state level to get our fair share there as well. Uh, based on the formula assumptions in the fourth tranche, it does appear that the 135 is not going to come our way. However, we know a portion should, and we're going to push for every dollar uh, of, of those expenditures, um, of those expenses, because again, they're out of the door. Uh, this doesn't touch at all uh, loss revenue. Uh, we're hopeful for another uh, surplus coming from the federal government. But as you know, um, it's not coming yet, but I, I really, I really believe that it. Well, for us, it's it's not so much as uh, if it's it's more on the end of rather when, and of course, not knowing you cannot factor 
uh, those dollars into uh, a budget at all. Uh, but when those dollars come and how they come, we will, you know, um, um, be as flexible as we need to uh, as relates to our financial uh, position. However, um, I, I needed to say that because uh, as we have responded, not only uh, to the pandemic, we have responded to the needs of our community as it relates to the budget. In 2020, you know that uh, we had to move uh, very swiftly uh, based on this pandemic, moving quickly, getting and securing a COI, uh, Certificate of Indebtedness, uh, 50 million. Uh, initially, we thought we would need that to bridge the gap in 2020, but the way that we've structured our budget, uh, we're able to hold that on the 2021 side, uh, again, just in case. Uh, we have also uh, been able to do multiple things in 2020 that set us up for uh, the 2021 budget. So in 2020, you know, uh, you've heard us in terms of put, uh, putting, I've had to put a freeze on all um, hiring. I've had to put a freeze, of course, on travel. Um, I have had to uh, ask the civil service for a waiver uh, that would allow me to move forward with furloughs, um, six uh, pay days out of the last six pay periods of 2020. Uh, the first paycheck uh, that our folks received with that reduction was this past uh, Friday. So our people have already, they started, you know, to feel um, the burden uh, of this, but it's, it, it's necessary. Along with uh, the furloughs, uh, I went forward with a early retirement incentive program uh, for our uh, employees that have been vested and could just take an early uh, retirement as well. So we've done multiple things on that front, uh, as well as you know going the extra mile, digging in cushions, as I as I, I tell my folks. Our financial team was able to. Uh, uncover millions that sat unspent literally for decades. We called a board of trusts uh, meeting uh, that body that had not met in three decades. And we released over a million dollars. Most went to libraries that were funds, many different funds. These are people who left funds with the city for their loved ones. I mean, all kinds of things. But the bottom line uh, was that it had not been touched. So we were able uh, to move those dollars alone, again, that had not been touched in, in some cases over a century. Um, we have also uh, been able uh, to ensure that um, in terms of contracts, looked at contracts, both current and even forecasting into uh, the future about you know, cutting uh, contracts going into 2021. So other things have been done but, the, but um, as we stand now, our budget for 2021 is a, um, it, it is a uh, consequential, it is optimistic. Uh, it is without a structural deficit, which was our goal, right? Not wanting to get into 2021 with a structural deficit because it was so important as, you know, asking this question and telling my folks, we gotta make sure all the hard work that we've done over the past two and a half years that none of it is thrown out of the window. And you know, during a crisis, a fiscal crisis, and of course a global pandemic, an opportunity to throw things out of the window, well, that's there as well, especially with outside pressures, wanting you to make quick decisions, but not factoring in how it's going to impact the overall. Uh, not only the public health of our community, but absolutely uh, the fiscal well-being of our city and these protections that are so uh, necessary. One was making sure that we protected our credit rating. So as we moved in and presented our budget with no structural deficit in 2021, we were also uh, notified by our rating agents, uh, our rating uh, credit uh, rating agencies on last week a Friday that the city of New Orleans would not be downgraded, that our rating is still stable. That is huge for the city of New Orleans and BGR, that should mean a lot 
uh, to you and this audience. We were taken off of the negative uh, watch list. But of course, right, with every other city, well, many have, are starting to be downgraded. But, you know, we're not off of the, um, the watch list itself because, of course, we're going to be watched meaning how we move forward with our 2021 budget. How do we ensure that we protect our fund balance? How do we um, be sure you know, that we don't uh, uh, spend uh, or, or run a budget on a, uh, on a loan, so to speak, with that COI? So all of those steps that have yet to be taken in 2021 have to be taken. And that's going to be something you know, that I just push hard on so that we do not uh, get downgraded. It means so much to our community and to our city. Of course, it does to every city. But look, one of the things, again, how we came in here strong was our public voted in 19, 2019, November, on that 500 million for bond sales. Well, set us up nicely in the midst of the pandemic and a fiscal crisis because that 250 plus million in bond sales that we're gonna go for 2021, huh, it's gonna go stronger and longer for us with an improved and a nice credit rating. Again, you know that. So that uh, uh, bond sales that are tied to those um, capital projects and those investments in terms of infrastructure, maintenance fund, economic development, affordable housing, you know it better than me, that is going to act as a local stimulus, again, as we move through this pandemic, but as we move towards a recovery, how we move. So um, I'm, you know, of course, excited uh, about that. Also, um, um, the cyber attack that you all mentioned that happened in, in December set us up again nicely to segue into um, remote work uh, place. We also had to move very quickly uh, to get um, ourselves in order uh, to issue, um, you know, to move forward with our procurement practices. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we have been able to uh, get over 300 million of projects out of the door since March. Uh, we're on the track to issue about 200, right around 275 million more um, out of the door November. So soon to be this meaning November is coming soon. So um, 275 more million out of the door for this year. We had our last, um, what do we call it? Industry day. Uh, this month, getting contractors all ready and prepared for what's coming out of the door uh, in November. So we're excited uh, definitely about that. Uh, also, uh, some other things, uh, we were able to get our 2.3 million uh, back to our city from the uh, Champion Square uh, lease agreement. I kind of mentioned that when I spoke with you all in 2018, how the city had not got a dime from that deal. Well, we made it happen working together, got that done. Also, um, as it relates to franchise agreements, I believe I mentioned that, how the city had not gotten her fair share relative to uh, our utilities or utilities digging in our, our public rights of way. CenturyLink was an example. We got 5.5 million, got that check um, through the door, even through a pandemic. So we haven't stopped working. The city hall, city hall has not shut down literally cannot afford to. Um, I have to make sure that we remain um, just vigilant and, and focused on getting uh, these uh, federal projects done. Uh, the joint infrastructure projects, of course, as you know, tied to infrastructure. Had my meeting with FEMA on Friday, as I do often, but let me tell you, in this climate, nothing is off the table. So, we're having to double down even harder as we move into 2021 on these projects, simply because I need to make sure that by 2022, everything, meaning it's not only penciled in notices to proceed, meaning projects out of the door because, um, we're afraid that the dollars will be uh, taken from us. And you know, the deadline is 2023. 
But as I sit and I discuss with our FEMA partners who have been relentless in working with us, we want to make sure that these NTPs are set done uh, by 2022. 20, uh, so um, that means doing more with less, yes, in the midst of a pandemic, but we can do this. And it also means streamlining efficiencies as we have started to do, and we will uh, continue to do that. Um, now, I'll wrap it up because I think you have questions, but just know uh, the 2021 budget, it definitely is surgical. Um, we have had to, I have had to make sure that I built in 27, 26, I'm sorry, 26, 27, 26. Um, furlough days in 2021, um, had to build that in. Uh, also what's built into our budget is um, the anticipation, and I'll need your help with this, uh, the anticipation of our people, our public, uh, passing a, a, a renewal, a millage renewal in December, uh, December 15th. Now, it will come as, um, it will be a renewal. It has been restructured, uh, more aligned with our priorities of the day today, not 20 years ago. Um, we have restructured it to be focused again on maintenance, infrastructure maintenance, uh, economic development, of course, uh, affordable housing, again, aligned with our priorities, not with the, not just with the bond sales, but with this, um, with this renewal, uh, our libraries, as well as early childhood education. Uh, we are rolling off, as you know, uh, the roll off is about 41 million of what it's meant to our budget today. As we look at 2021, uh, with the uh, decrease uh, that we built in from 8.6 mils to 5.8, I believe I have it right, uh, we're looking at 23 to 25 million in 2021. So that will come as a form of a tax decrease for our people uh, while upholding those priorities uh, for a renewal and a rededication of those um, those dollars, the five meals that we're asking. That is baked into the 2021 budget with some in anticipation, again, that, um, that the people will pass it. And you know, we, we can't do it alone. But as we look uh, forward to 2021, uh, one of the most important factors uh, to consider again is that we're not carrying over a structural deficit, very important. And um, 2021 is a consequential time and we will pivot you know, as necessary. And you should also know that every, every single day, you know, I have to look at three different scenarios. Um, scenario A, as I call it, is if we have to regress. You know, if we have to go back, um, which will have an impact on everything. Of course, our economy and our people, everything. Um, if we stay the same, meaning if we have slightly opened up, which we're open, right? We're open, businesses are open. But in terms of capacity and expanding capacity, we stay the same, what does that mean? Well, we get, we're healthier, we're, we're doing good, we're moving in the right direction. Then the third scenario, scenario C, is man, if we continue to do great, what does that mean? Further growth in terms of in terms of uh, revenue. So that those three uh, scenarios will always play a role as we move uh, through this pandemic and as we're guided by data and as we're uh, guided uh, by uh, science in this. You should also know from the work of our fair share. So I touch heavily on uh, infrastructure, it's just very important. 183 million even as it relates to invoices totaling, uh, have gone out 43 million, uh, same time period, uh, very successful in terms of contract bids. And that's now, I told you from March to September that 434 is now into September and even factoring in uh, some work in October. Uh, we have moved forward with fair share money on the frequency changers, improving redundancy for the sewage and water board. Yes, we have an issue with turbine four as it stands today, um, as you all know, uh, but that's why we are moving 
uh, to build a new plane, but while we have to still fly our old one uh, at the same time, but those projects are moving forward. The uh, transfer station is, is rolling uh, in partnership again, working with Entergy, capital out outlay dollars in the door. You know, so I'm feeling pretty good. Affordable housing rolling on that front, issued about 20 million uh, this year, uh, all really through COVID. Uh, homelessness is a part of that as well. Uh, we have shifted about 430 of our folks since this pandemic into uh, permanent supportive housing. My goal was not to have them return to the street. That's still my goal, challenge, work in progress every day. Not everyone wants to come off the street, no matter how hard we pound, but that will continue to be a focus. Uh, Seven uh, million more will be awarded uh, uh, this month as it relates to developments. Uh, 652 units are currently under construction. Units are single family homes as well as um, a, you know units in an apartment, but we classify them as units. That's just the, the terminology. Uh, 846 of them are in pre-development, uh, working well with Hano, um, building on these uh, scatter sites, you know, as uh, my Hano director, Miss Yvette, calls, uh, calls, says, you know, taking our property off a of railway, getting these projects rolling. Uh, in June, uh, 3.5 million was awarded to us in workforce, 6 million uh, received from the state. Uh, as our grant uh, proposal is used as a pilot for many municipalities across the state uh, because we had just a plan for using the national dislocated worker dollars that we will help folks pivot into uh, new employment streams. Um, as of today, uh, we have about 15,000 um, uh, that continue to be on UI, 15,826, I believe to be exact. Also, um, we have about 970 job orders in hire, meaning to hire, um, and 2,394 positions that are available. So, you know, we really need to double down. We are, as it relates to this workforce piece. I mean, I'm looking for, just like we were monitoring, and I told my people this, just like we're monitoring uh, uh, the virus every day and with dashboards and data. I want that for workforce. I want to see every day how are we moving folks into these jobs, into training, uh, because it's what we have to do and we need uh, jobs filled. They're there. And it does uh, go with the economy. So with that, I'm going to stop. I can go on and on. Uh, the work is real. You can't make it up. And um, I'll just take questions as I get them and um, get to my, well, I'm, I'm still early. I felt like I had a briefing to go to. But um, Amy uh, and um, uh, Hunter, I'll turn it back over to you. And thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Cantrell, for that information and for those insights. And consistent with BGR tradition, we will now start <clears throat> taking questions from the audience. Um, as a reminder for those of you in the audience, if you have a question you'd like to submit, please access the Q&A icon in the bottom center of your screen, type your question and hit return. So we have had some very thoughtful questions uh, coming in, Mayor Cantrell, as you've been talking. So I will now present them to you. Uh, so here's one on the millage proposal. We have an audience member who's asking, when did the library's dedicated millage come onto your radar and why was it chosen to fund the Economic Development Fund? Sure, so the uh, library renewal has always been on our radar as we have looked and focused on uh, meals and dollars that would roll off. So again, as you look at budget years, as you look at uh, fiscal years, you don't look at one year. You look at where are we and where do we wanna go for our city in terms of forecasting. So it's always been something that we've looked at because libraries have always been a priority and will continue uh, to be a priority. A part of one of the things we started um, for our first budget, and that was in 2018, but in 2019, a real uh, full year uh, to focus on. And that was zero-based budgeting practices. That was be being able to look at departments' budgets or agencies' budget um, and drill down on how they're spending the budget, meaning that funds that are allocated and approved versus how they're not spending. And as we started to look at our meals in global, not just the library, but everything that we know and we knew we wanted 
to uplift as a priority, including libraries, but also shifting towards um, more priorities that we know have come from the ground, meaning the people, the public. Early childhood education is one of them. Uh, an example, the city first, um, we're first municipality funding early childhood education at 3 million, but needing to find a dedicated funding stream to make it happen. Thus, looking at things comprehensively, um, factoring in based on this pandemic as well, when you go to the voters for renewal, chances of approval based on the library holding off, chances in global the best because it represents and it reflects not only the values of our of the the citizens but also the priorities of the citizens and of the city administration so um we noticed the uh meals for libraries uh, earlier on and remember i was on the city council so um i've been a part of uh, libraries pushing a long time even was one for uh the millage uh, renewal initially that increased the budget of the libraries the library's budget will not change. Uh, what it will, what it will do, is become aligned with one their expenditures versus what their budget is. Significantly, uh, the library has not been uh, spending its budget for several years now, uh, and we can go on without any any. Um, the, the library would have three years to complete spending its budget if they were going on with the surplus that they've had carried for over seven years now. So libraries are gonna be great. Uh, when you look at early childhood education, uh, you definitely factor it into economic development. And of course, uh, literacy and everything that our libraries mean to us, uh, it's all a part of the, the strategy uh, and the priorities from the city. A related question. Uh, this audience member says it is my understanding that early childhood education services rely on the library space and possibly programs how will rededicating the millage affect early childhood education services the library as i mentioned just a few minutes ago uh, has been operating annually carrying a budget surplus what that means is that they're, they haven't been spending the, the, the money that's been allocated to them. However, they have been operating uh, at their fullest capacity. So what that tells us, and as it's budgeted, nothing will change at all. If nothing else, with efficiencies, improvements will happen. What's happening right now, because it's not just early childhood education when you talk about libraries, you have to also factor in workforce, okay? Where our people go, how they get connected to resources, training to get a job. So it's not just um, about children, it's about all of our people and our libraries are positioned very nicely to meet our people where they are. What's being built out now in the uh, opportunity zones, the um, enterprise zones in our branches, OBES is setting up there now. That is the Office of Business and External uh, Services. They will be um, in libraries throughout the city. This is a part of streamlining uh, government practices and efficiencies and services. Uh, it's also bringing uh, workforce uh, as well as business development to libraries as well. So all of this, uh, is a part of the fabric of our libraries. The budget uh, is not being uh, downgraded at all. It's only uh, being more efficient. So we're excited about it. All right, shifting gears. We have an audience member who's asking, is the city better prepared for a cyber attack? Sure, um, yes, the city is better prepared for a cyber attack. Uh, the city, uh, my administration was prepared for a cyber attack as it relates to getting cyber insurance. And so with that, we have increased our insurance, of course, as well. But with that, uh, the cyber attack, as I mentioned in my presentation, gave us a real opportunity to improve um, our systems internally. So yes, uh, we are better prepared. And with some of the um, changes that we made, uh, even pre-cyber attack with our financial systems was um, moving and shifting our things to the cloud. So yes, we're better prepared for a cyber attack and we're better prepared for um, remote work. We're better prepared for building in efficiencies that are required for a more uh, streamlined approach to servicing residents in our city. We have an audience member who says, Errol Williams' office recently stated 
that, the plan, that they plan to reduce commercial tax assessments by up to 57%. So here's the question, and we've actually received a few questions on this. Why should the citizens of the city expect austerity while businesses are receiving tax breaks? Ask the assessor. The assessor is an elected official. The assessor is an elected official. Um, the impact absolutely will be across the board, will be to the city, as you know, right, in terms of revenue, on the revenue side. We'll also, um, as I'm hearing from residents, they're feeling the burden. They're feeling like they're being disproportionately impacted. And so I think that there needs to be um, a, a more a collaborative approach to it. And I look forward to working with you to work with the assessor. Uh, okay, here's another question. What zoning and policy changes outside of tax abatements and other subsidies could the city implement to increase New Orleans affordable housing supply? Sure, so as it relates to affordable housing and what we recently passed was the inclusionary zoning uh, ordinance that one I started working on as a city councilwoman worked with this current council and we were able to get that done. Also baking in um, in terms of in the Office of Community Development, how we leverage our public dollar with uh, private development. And so we have made sure that our dollar is going towards projects, one that uphold our priorities, our special needs community, um, you know, accessibility, uh, making sure permanent, uh, even affordability, um, uh, making sure that um, folks that are in their homes now that we, keep them in their homes. So the um, owner occupied rehab is also factored into our affordable housing uh, initiative. We did have to, unfortunately during COVID, we took a hit on that because we couldn't go you know, into our people's homes. So um, that program, hopefully um, we're looking by the end of November, December, we'll be able to activate uh, that program, stand it back up. Uh, but the COVID-19 guidelines prohibited us from doing that. But as I see it, zoning changes and the like, we've done that. Now we have the landscape that we need to move forward with approving uh, projects, making sure again, they're aligned with our priorities and also uh, leveraging that public dollar uh, efficiently. All right, we have a citizen who's asking, should the sewage and water board be required to immediately notify its rate payers when essential pieces of its infrastructure are offline? Okay, I think that the sewage and water board does that. Um, when essential pieces of equipment are offline, they do notify you. The bottom line is, is that we have an antiquated system that has not been maintained. It's over hundred years old. So now we've decided to build a new plane while in fact, we still have to, to operate the old one. So I believe the sewage and water board has improved its level of communication with the public, especially I would have to say, man, in the past several months uh, in, in throughout this uh, uh, 2020 and all the, the, not only the pandemic, but just hurricane season, uh, we really have uh, hired a, a new communications director as well. And uh, in real time, communicating with residents and residents are responding. We know that because we see it and we hear it. All right, here we have an audience member asking, will musicians hear good news soon? And, and she asked, my husband is a full-time professional musician. He has not worked in many months. Thank you for any information you can provide. Sure, well, I hope so. I hope so, musicians, is in the blood of the city of New Orleans. It's a lifeline. Um, our, our musicians, our gig economy workers have been the, the hardest hit. Uh, right now, the guidelines do not, and state guidelines do not allow uh, for, for certain uh, entertainment options. Um, working through that, hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, we'll be able to stand up uh, musicians in a way that we have not, but at the same time we have. Um, I would encourage um, you, your partnership with the Office of Cultural Economy that has been uh, working with musicians, hiring them to perform virtually, that's ongoing right now. And they're performing in different venues across the city of New Orleans and also getting them lined up uh, with our film industry as well. So if you wanna reach out to me directly, I can make sure uh, that we plug you in there, but I also wanna make sure that um, you are you've applied or your husband has applied for resources that still may be available uh, to him. 
uh, but hopefully soon, sooner rather than later, we can we can hear the good sounds of, of the city in, in, a, in the way we are accustomed. Uh, okay, so here's an, here an audience member is observing New Orleans population fell by around 1,000 residents between 2016 and 2018, the city's first population decline since Hurricane Katrina. What do you think were the key factors in the decline and how is your administration working to reverse the trend? Okay, so we just completed, completed our census 2020, and you know, like me, that the real tracker of data and population growth and trends are tied to the census. Uh, the city of New Orleans, with this 2020, is the first census, as I say, since 2000. So even the the um, um, the 2016 and the and the shifts that you're talking about, um, they're not accurate. Um, the 2020 census, what I'm excited about is that the city finished and we'll get our, our percentage, the actual percentage very soon, but we know it's over 58%. Uh, in 2010, our respondents were at 43%. In, 20, in 2000, it was 61%. So many of our people participated, looking forward to those numbers. We should have our count hopefully by November, um, but also, you know, they have to be certified and the like. Um, but the city of New Orleans in terms of growth, where we've been since Katrina, I'm not looking down on our city at all in terms of growth. Been there on the ground and we're continuing to make that progress, we're seeing it. So in terms of why, many uh, different reasons, people move, people come, people go. But as I know, as of today, people are coming. They're moving here right now. Here we have an audience member asking, how is your administration actively collaborating with local officials and neighboring parishes to boost the regional economy and address the needs of citizens and businesses across the metropolitan area? What is the city doing to enhance regional collaboration on high priority needs? Sure, so as the city of New Orleans and mayor of the city, I am on the regional board, SOLA participate in those meetings um, that happen quite frequently. As you know, all of you, all of our uh, workforce, uh, e uh, business development, economic development teams are a part of that consortium. So I serve on that. Uh, also, I serve as chair of the Regional Planning Commission. Again, all my my brothers, I call them brothers and sisters, you know, we, we're, we're together all, all the time, especially as me being chair of that uh, and just how I have made it a priority to make myself uh, just around the state. You know, I've done that since day one. It's paid off dividends for the city and also as it relates to relationships. So relationships are intact, definitely communication. I was uh, in St. Bernard Parish with my, my brother, uh, president last week, uh, doing a um, tour of Lake Bourne, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the levees, you know, how they're impacted, what can, what can I do to help? We, we work regionally, we collaborate, and how I do that is talk to my people, pick up the phone, go visit with them, go sit with them, and talk through strategies and, um, and opportunities that we have come our way. Uh, Mayor Cantrell, what are your thoughts on the potential to keep some pandemic-related budget cuts in place as the city's finances recover and using the savings to fund high-priority needs? Using the savings to, wait a minute, I don't understand the question. So, so the question is asking whether you have thought about keeping pandemic-related budget cuts in place, even once the economy has recovered and shifting those the savings from those budget cuts to other high priority needs. I see. So one of the things um, that, you know, every disaster seems to bring you, even Katrina was a horrible opportunity. Um, this, this pandemic, you know, looking at it as well um, as a horrible opportunity, um, not just a responsibility, but really an obligation. So it has provided, um, some new ways of, of, of doing things and ways that we're going to, that one, we embraced, but we're gonna keep them rolling. 
So whether that is the consolidation of various uh, departments, you know, I started even pre-COVID with uh, creating the Office of Business and External Affairs uh, and had to move into just making, continuing to make that happen because that was about streamlining efficiencies and to making sure that breaking down those silos, not duplicating efforts. I don't need, you know, uh, uh, different departments doing the same thing. So um, OBES is a part of that. Even as relates one uh, simple but meaningful thing, um, the HDOC and BCC. Well, I don't need two directors, I need one. So consolidating uh, BCC and uh, HDLC. Um, other practices um, looking at moving forward because we haven't done them all because we're gonna continue to keep things in place, but also uh, being able to uh, allow folks in terms of remote uh, work um, as it uh, relates to uh, looking at and being very surgical about the cuts that we've had to make um, and looking at ways to build in greater efficiencies in terms of public safety around uh, fire, EMS and the like. Uh, so yes, I do uh, see opportunities um, that the city has taken advantage of, but that we will um, keep in place and moving things along forward, even going paperless. And, and so the budget book this year was, I'm telling you, much more streamlined and compact than any years that I've seen before. And we wanna to move towards you know, um, paperless. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, to streamline various contracts, uh, sanitation, looking at that, one day a week, looking at that. So there are many uh, different ways and opportunities, I think for us to, to get better, uh, to do more with less. Uh, and, and that's how we're focusing on it. Thank you. Uh, we have an audience member who's observing violent crime has been on the rise in the CBD. Do you have any specific plans to focus on this problem? Sure. So violent crime is on a rise across the United States of America. In the city of New Orleans, in regards to shootings and homicides, that's, that, is, that is our focus, which is that uptick, that 50, right at 57% in terms of homicides, uh, which, is, which is a problem. Uh, and um, and have some good sense of who's committing the perpetrators. Uh, we also have some good sense of the um, connectedness uh, to uh, the violent acts. And that also brings to the warehouse district CBD, that uptick is, um, is associated with our increase uh, in visitors that we have been hosting um, as evacuees in our city. Uh, and we're just working through it, um, definitely uh, visible, but we have had some tragedies, quite frankly, as it relates to um, downtown and, and our evacuees, but we're working through it. Thank you. One final question. Uh, given the crash course and crisis management that 2020 has delivered to all of us, can you share the most important lessons you've learned for managing and leading through crises? Sure. So, you know, my, my um, work in this city has been tied to crisis management. And I think that it has um, played a major role um, in how I have been able uh, to not only build a strong team, but keep uh, cohesion within my team. Um, and we have not had a honeymoon. So it didn't start with COVID-19 with us. It started two weeks after my inauguration and 23 days after being inaugurated with our first hurricane season. Uh, and of course, met with the various challenges that were um, expressed uh, during the beginning of this call. So lessons learned is communication as, as I have learned. Um, in a crisis, a crisis is, is not a time to lay back. It's a time to stand and, and stand taller and fight harder. You don't sit down, you stand. Um, uh, and making sure that I provide my, my team uh, with the support that they need. I feel like uh, even not only a drill sergeant, but you just, in terms of uh, showing the love, showing the appreciation, showing that you know your folks are your greatest asset to responding to disasters. You don't do it alone. And so every step of the way, our public safety team, um, our essential workers on every level um, have, haven't stopped 
in the midst of even the pandemic being hit themselves. So the best lesson learned is stay on top with my people, um, stand with my people, uh, making them know that they're not out there on the line by themselves because I'm right there with them. Uh, and, and doing the work and it's inspiring, we inspire and motivate one another. It's motivating your people to stay focused on the mission and to do not be um, persuaded or distracted by naysayers. And as Bloomberg told uh, uh, our mayors this week, or was it last week, he said, don't be extra uh, distracted by the naysayers um, because the, the power belongs to the people who fail to listen to them. So um, that's what I do with my people. Best lesson learned, stay focused on the mission, communication, have each other's back. Thank you, Mayor Cantrell. Uh, we are out of time, uh, but I, I wanna thank you tremendously for speaking with us this morning, for taking time to talk to our, our audience. Thank you so much. All right, you all be safe. Thank you, you as well. Uh, thanks again to Iberia Bank First Horizon for its generous sponsorship of this breakfast briefing. And thanks to all of you for being with us this morning. A recording of today's breakfast briefing will be available on our website, bgr.org. The best way to stay on top of all BGR events and research is to become a member. We regularly engage with our members and we value this dialogue tremendously. We also rely on our members to help amplify BGR's policy recommendations. If you're not currently a member, please visit bgr.org to join the ranks of concerned citizens working with us to improve local government. We hope this event has been informative. We wish you and yours the very best in the days and weeks to come, and we look forward to seeing you at our next